Welcome back to Step Up, where we learn from the best of the best of the best of the best in business. I'm David Wolf, media producer, joined as always by your host, speaker psychologist, supporter of military families, sassy grandmother, Dr. Margarita Gurry. Well, thank you, David. Today, I'm super excited because this Cuban grandmother gets to interview a Cuban millennial. Oh, I love it. All in business connect more, make more money, and I also think have more fun. <laughs> Welcome, Amanda Abella. Thank you for having me. I am so psyched that I am on a podcast <laughs> with a Cuban grandma. We are going to have so much fun. It's going to yes, get lit. He, he will. <laughs> That's millennial language. It's going to get lit on this podcast. <laughs> I'm learning a new vocabulary, millennial. I'm getting it. As I told you earlier, I'm learning how to roll my eyes and do my neck thing, but I'm not getting it right. I'm, I'm trying to embrace the better balance with business and work that millennials have. So tell us a little bit. You're a motivational speaker. You have won awards for your blogs. You're teaching people how to make money. Ah, that's the wonderful. How did you get started with all this? Oh, my gosh. Well, I like to joke around and say that it was kind of a big accident because in a lot of ways it found me. But in reality, I think what happened was I just saw certain opportunities and then kept putting one foot in front of the other. And that's how I landed here. But my story goes back to, you know, 2010. I graduated from college six months without a job. You know, great time to graduate from college. It was the best. The economy was so good, right? <laughs> without those months, uh, without knowing to do, you may not have noticed this gem. Yeah, exactly. So now I'm like, wow, that is actually one of the best things to ever happen to me. The fact that I was like broke and unemployed and was thrown into this sort of situation where I started questioning everything I'd been taught growing up, you know, go to school, get a job, make money, retire, that whole paradigm. Well, I got thrown into a world where it looked at, at the time we didn't know that it just pretty much wasn't going to exist anymore because it was still kind of early on, but it was being questioned, right? It was being brought to question. Yeah. I started questioning things. I mean, to the point where I was having severe anxiety, I was having panic attacks because I felt like, you know, everything I've been told is a lie. I was having one of those weird existential crises moments. Good. <laughs> Right. Those so are I joke very productive if we pay attention to them. Exactly. Good. And so I joke around. I'm like, I got my quarter life crisis a little early. Mine started at 21. <laughs> um, and I think it's just because I was paying attention to what was around me. So I started questioning things and I was like, well, I don't I don't know what I'm doing. A friend of mine at the time uh, noticed that I was struggling. I'd moved back home after college. I was really struggling, you know, emotionally, financially, just not a good time. And he hands me this book called The Art of Nonconformity by Chris Gillibo. He also wrote $100 Startup, and he's got a few others now. But his first one was The Art of Nonconformity. And my friend, who'd known me for many years, was basically like, I think you're going to like this book. I think you need to read this. I know you're going through a hard time. Just read it. Just do me a favor and read it. So I was like, it's a good um, friend. Okay. Yeah. So I was like, OK. So I started reading the book and the whole book was about how the guy never had a regular job. He'd always kind of done his own thing. At the time, uh, he had challenged himself to visit every country in the world by 35, I think. And I think at this point he has accomplished that. At the time that he wrote the book, he was working on it. And I was wow. like, it was kind of like this light bulb moment of, whoa, wait a minute. I don't have to live life the way that I was told it's supposed to look like I I'm it's fair game now I can make whatever I want out of this situation and that was kind of the first little light bulb moment so I was like okay I need to make money what can I do because you know for a lot of us it really just starts off that way like we need to make money so I googled how to start freelance writing because I always wanted to be a writer and one of my clients at the time which was only paying like 10 bucks an article had these open assignments for personal finance articles and I thought Hmm. I know nothing about money. <laughs> School didn't teach me anything about money. I kind of need to know about money for life. I'm not going to go research this on my own because I really hate numbers and math scares me. And this seems very <laughs> frightening to me. But if I'm getting paid, then I have incentive to go do it. So what if I take these assignments and then I'm getting paid to learn about money? How so that's what Beautiful. I did. So that's what I did. I started a blog at the same time to hold myself accountable. At the time, it was literally stuff like, here's what I learned in a Susie Orman book. I'm going to go try it. Or here's what, what I read. what was the name in of that blog? Your first 
at the time it was called Grad Meets World. So it was a little millennial humor. That's from cute. The, yeah, my best friend named it actually. <laughs> and it was just very humble beginnings like that. And I just, you know, kept blogging on the side. This whole world of like online marketing hadn't blown up yet. Influencer marketing wasn't a thing yet. People quitting their jobs to blog full time wasn't a thing yet. Uh, and I, but I started seeing the shift happening. And I just kept putting one foot in front of the other. Did have regular employment. I was a recruiter for a while. So I was like the middleman between job candidates and then positions within Fortune 500 companies. And then um, what ended up happening one day was one day I came to the realization of, wait a minute, this is all BS. Like I interview <laughs> people every day who got laid off last week and then they have no no savings. They they have no extra job on the side. Their their entire lives are hanging in the balance of someone else making decisions for them. Mm. Took me two years to have that aha moment working at that job. Um, and at the time, I'd read enough personal finance and business books and had been in the blogging world long enough to realize there is something here. Something is changing in the economy. I have to go chase it. So I quit my job. And that was almost five years ago. <laughs> wow. 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 That's amazing. Well, I'm glad you did. And I know that um, thousands and thousands of people who know about you and why isn't it millions? So we want, Dan Working and on I want to be a part of helping you. We want to be a part of helping, you, <laughs> of helping you get to the millions because we think we're new, we're fans, new fans. Had I known about you earlier, I would have been an old fan, but uh, <laughs> I'm a new fan. So I learned about you just recently. Okay. So tell us then, why is it that most people, when they have such a stalled moment in their lives, why do most of them just sabotage themselves and not allow themselves to have an aha? Oh, my goodness. I've actually been thinking about this a lot lately because my birthday is next month and I get really re introspective right before my birthday. And I've well, had good. a lot of people I've had a lot of people recently tell me, how did you come up with that at 22 years old? Like, how did you even come to that conclusion that you needed to start questioning everything. And for so long, I was like, this is so basic. How could people not have seen this? Um, but now I'm starting to realize I was just in a in a position in my life. Um, I was raised Catholic and we have this thing in Catholicism called the dark night of the soul. I yes. had just gotten out of Catholic school too, by the way. I, I know went to that a Catholic dark college. night of the soul. Yeah. And I was going through sort of like my own little dark night of the soul, which for those who don't know, it's sort of like this spiritual experience, sort of like that existential crisis, like I said. So I think I just allowed myself to be in the throes of the anxiety and the crisis and feeling my feelings and just seeing where it was going to go. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I realized was part of the reason I was struggling so much. And I think this is why people end up not moving, right? It's because they want to control everything mm. and they want security. And I was thrown into a situation where I was realizing that doesn't really exist. So once I, I made the realization that it doesn't exist, then it was easier for me to move. Okay, so I think that reminds me of you were one of your favorite quotes talks about there's no such thing as certainty. Where did you get that quote? Did, did you make that up? I think I made it up. I don't know if I've ever read it anywhere. I think it was just when I realized at my job, like, I mean, the economy tanked, people could get fired from one day to the next. I think for me, that was the quote that actually really helped me quit my job because yeah. I was like, what is the difference between going out on my own or having a regular job where I can get fired next week? Right. There right. is no difference. Right. There is it's all an illusion, in other words. no difference. Whether you're yeah, inside or out, the, the, uh, there's a quote. Let me see if I can find it. It's so relevant to what you're talking about. Having a job is an illusion of security and being an entrepreneur is an illusion of freedom. I think that was it. <laughs> That's actually well, really funny. Yeah, I, I can't remember that, where I heard there's it. There's big truth to that. That's interesting. Well, I think it's wonderful. So let's move forward. Let's pretend that everyone in the audience has a dark night moment that they didn't throw away. Let's say even if it was 50 years ago that you had that moment, go back, retrieve it. What do we do then? Give us suggestions because you are really good at understanding how people sabotage themselves. So mm -hmm. talk about sabotage and suggestions moving forward, a do over. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the ways people sabotage themselves is they just don't ask for help. Or they don't try to look for the lessons and things. So I think part of the reason my friend was even able to show up in that moment 
right. And hand me that book was because I was asking for help. I may not have like directly been asking for it, but I was open to it. And I think sometimes people, instead of taking the help, they get insulted or they feel ashamed or they feel like they can't take it or they feel like a victim or they're embarrassed or whatever. Instead of just taking the help and taking the lesson for what it is, they're too stuck in their pride. I think is yeah. what I'm looking for. Yeah, the ego. Yeah. Um, so, so that's definitely a way that I see them sabotaging themselves quite a bit. I think another way that I see them sabotaging themselves, and I see this sometimes with my private clients, because I don't just work with millennials. I also work with people like you who are like, I need to start thinking like a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, the millennial so I have, wannabes. Yeah. So I have a couple of private coaching clients who are boomers. And one of the things I've noticed in terms of how, you know, that particular segment sabotages a little bit more than the millennials do is they hold on to stuff that doesn't work. Yes, we do. They just yes. do not let it go. Yes. And some of that, though, is um, when I went off on my own business, I tried to do the official thing. And I think I worked in a private practice as an employee for a year, but I didn't like some of the ethics and I didn't like some of the practices and I couldn't do it. So as any wise and thoughtful professional would do with this child, I quit without another job. <laughs> <laughs> and I, st I started my own practice and um, the first month I doubled my income. I was shocked. And what I learned was that if you get fed up enough or scared enough, you don't really feel so stuck because maybe you should use those feelings to propel you. Um, right. I think that's really important, too, is people don't know how to use those feelings of uncertainty and fear to fuel them. I think a lot of people get stuck in the I'm just going to sit here and pity myself and they don't know how to turn that energy into action. I see a lot of people get stuck there as well. They over intellectualize it mm -hmm. instead of actually doing something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in terms of then earning power, let's say someone's in the audience and they're stuck. They're, they have a fine life. They're doing okay, but they're not, they're not needing a life. They're not exitosos. They're not leading a, an excellent life, right? Mm -hmm. What do you suggest they do? What's the first step, second step, third step? What? How do they get from here to a more glorious life of choice? I think it's realizing that you have choices in the first place. I think we go through a lot in our lives where there's like a lot of social and cultural conditioning. And again, this is something I've noticed more with like the older private coaching clients of yes. you know other generations. I mean, in those cases, it's decades of stuff they need to unlearn. They don't even know like they what? have choices. What are some of the things they need to unlearn? Just rattle them off. Um, Self-worth issues, for example. I work with mostly women. So for the women, it's a lot of you need to behave a certain way. You need to be nice. You can't ruffle feathers. It's about being liked, not respected. Be a nice girl. There's a lot of that type of stuff as well. You're expected to behave a certain way. That's what I see a lot, especially with, with the women. I mean, and that's decades of stuff they need to unlearn. Sometimes it's stuff like under earning. Uh, one in four American workers is an under earner, according to Barbara Stanny's Overcoming Under Earnings, some stats that she mentions in there. And the majority of them are women. If you've it, had decades and decades of, you know, over delivering, but being undercompensated yeah. for whatever reason, yeah. that's a very hard cycle to break if you are not aware of it. The most common reason I've heard older women my age, you know, sassy grandmas, is that we took a sacrifice so that we could be more there for the children. Mm -hmm. And the problem is then once the children are raised, they're still taking that stance. What has been your experience that you can do to help women go beyond that to something that they truly have always wanted? And not everyone wants to be an entrepreneur, but maybe mm -hmm. a Maybe a more job, more pay in the same job or a better job in the same company or become an entrepreneur. What What do you think? So here's where millennials are a little different. So, for example, for me, part of the reason I wanted to start my own business, and I remember having this thought at some point, was thinking to myself, you know what? I saw my mom bust her butt, raise two kids. She was a sandwich generation because my grandparents got to the U.S., much older, so they didn't have even the opportunity to save for retirement. So my mom was 
in the middle, that sandwich generation, and my father as well, and they were both only children. So they were in the, you know, being spouses, raising kids, and helping be caregivers for the older generations in the family as well. I saw how much they went through and what a struggle that was. And I just decided that's not going to be me. And I think with the way things are structured right now in our culture, the only way for me to have the flexibility that I want with the money I want to make is to do my own thing. So I'm going to spend my 20s doing that. Figuring that out, whatever that looks like, I had no idea at the time. I didn't even know where these thoughts were coming from, but I remember having them, right? And then that way, by the time I'm ready to sort of like settle down and have a family, if when that happens, right, I already am... I already have the systems in place where I can actually be there and not have to sacrifice the amount of money I'm making or my career because the flexibility is in place. Yeah, it's already built into your uh, into your workflow, your your life flow. It's built into my life already. So one of the things that I would recommend, going back to your question, is I think people kind of start backwards. They always think the answer is about money. It's not really about money. It's really about how you want to design your life, and money just allows you to do that. So rather than thinking about, okay, well, how much money do I want to make? The real question you should be asking yourself is what do I want my life to look like? And what does that mean for my finances? And so for people who can't even imagine what a life could look like, other than the sacrificial life, what what do you say to them? How can they understand the smorgasbord of life? (laughs) That's a great question. Um, I mean, there's lots of stuff out there. Like I was recently at the Tony Robbins Unleash the Power Within. I mean, if you really just want a quick jolt, go to a Tony Robbins seminar. (laughs) But if you're not going to do that, I think, and this is something that's helped with my coaching clients, is take a look at what you don't want first. We're pretty good at determining what we don't want. Like what? Well, you know, one of my clients, for example, no longer wants to be the girl who takes the blame for everything. She realized that was something she was... She realized that was something she was really identifying with. I think sometimes it goes back to what you said as well, is people just get fed up. I have so many students that come into my uh, group coaching program who are just fed up with being broke. And they're like, it's time. That's it. It's go time. I'm making it happen. Yeah. Um, You know, and and that's sometimes it's using that energy of being frustrated, like you said. What's really fascinating about that, too, Amanda, is is that many have said, well, the universe pays more attention. The universe responds when we talk about what we want and our our desires as opposed to the what you could call the negative thought patterns of what I don't want. The universe doesn't really uh, serve us when we are conscious or, or voicing those things. This really turns that on its uh, on its butt, doesn't it? Completely well, yeah, around. because people aren't really accustomed to voicing what it is they actually want. We're yeah. told not to. They right. may not even know. I mean, and it's just kind of like when right. someone's trying to find a business partner or a love partner, I always suggest what's the red, you know, what are the rule outs? What are, what are the drop dead list? The ones it's so that much are easier under, to do that. Yeah, yeah, it know? seems like and you said it early. You don't know. Yeah, I mean, you said we have a lot easier time, most of us, talking about what we don't want. That seems to rise to the top. You said it earlier. It's so true, you know. Well, because we're humans, and how do humans learn by experience? Right. All right, so someone decides they want to go off on their own. They know what they don't want. They know now what their lives are going to look like. Like, for instance, my daughter and her partner, they both want to be able to sail around the world and work remotely. He's a radiology guy, an inter, I can't say called interactive radiology, which is way cool, and he's finishing a residency. She's a senior accountant uh, with GM. So that's one of their goals later in life, and so they're kind of preparing that. I would have never thought of doing something like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, absolutely never. So let's say there's someone out there who finally has the thought. They kind of know what they want th- their life to look like. How do they then build the structure or processes to allow that? Well, there's actually two answers to this, and this is where my finance blogger brain is coming in. It depends on whether you want the option to work or if you have to work. So if you have to work, then it looks like, okay, well, how do I build a business where I can telecommute and do it from a boat with Wi-Fi? I have friends who do that. You know, they run blogs and they're sailing around. The boats have Wi-Fi or the planes or they're any part of the world, really. As long as they have Wi-Fi, they can work. That's actually one of the things that I did when I said I want flexibility. Okay, what does that look like? I got to be able to run something from my laptop. 
so I could do it from anywhere. Mm. So that's one of the options. The other option, and this is because I come originally from the personal finance blogging space, is there are a group of financial experts who are all about early retirement. So in the case of, you know, your daughter and her partner, and this depends on them and what they want to do. I mean, if they have good positions, you know, they could do what the, the FI bloggers do, which is like save like half your income for 10 years because you're making decent money and then you're done. You don't have to worry about working ever again. Wow. Yeah. I personally wouldn't do that because it, to me that sounds absolutely awful because I still have to work for someone else. So that's where it kind of depends on the personality and like what people are right. willing to do and, yeah. and all those types of things. It's an interesting my, structure, my bifurcating your income. She my did. best friend worked at a job at a government municipality that he didn't love. He was really good at it mm. for a long time and retired because it – and then he saved huge chunks. He didn't retire early. He retired at a, the, the earliest viejo you could be. I think it was 65, mm -hmm. right? Um, so early life viejo, uh, old person for those who don't speak Spanish. But I could never have standed at nine to five. I mean, I would have killed my soul. So that's kind of interesting. I mean, I quit the business because I was just fed up with the morality and realized I was working hard for someone else, not for myself. So Me I think too. by default, I became a millennial in, in my <laughs> attitude <laughs> and I've never really worked for anyone other than another year when I was doing something that was an interesting project. I've always yeah. had my own business. So those of us who have our own businesses then. Why don't most of them really succeed? What do they need to do to get to the next level, understanding their markets or whatever? What do we need to do to get to the next level? So I actually wrote an email for my list this morning because for my email list, I give them like certain teachable moments that I don't share publicly. Good. I just signed up for your list. Good. <laughs> and one of them is called... Um, it happened so fast. Like, keep an eye out for that subject line. It happened so okay. fast. It's going to be a good story. Good. Right? Thank you. <laughs> and what I mentioned was I said the story of my friend Ladon, right? And Ladon and I met a couple years, a few years ago. I had done like free consultations after a teleseminar. She was living in Austin or something. And that's how we initially met. She was in direct sales. She was kind of struggling, you know, didn't really know what direction she was moving in. I did a consultation with her and I basically taught her she could just sell her knowledge. I'm like, you've been running profit and loss reports for corporations for years you could do it in your sleep you could get paid to do it for other businesses but you know as a consultant to her that was like mind-blowing right so uh, a couple years go by and she recently moved to south florida so every monday we are going to soul cycle classes in the brickle area of south florida and a couple weeks ago she tells me she goes you know what i did and i was like what ladon what's going on right and she goes i quit my last contract job in december she also got fed up so she was done she was out right and she goes i got like six thousand dollars in sales in a few weeks and then this morning she sends me a text right and she's back from a conference in vegas she goes i signed another seventy two hundred dollars in sales and i'm following up on a twelve thousand dollar contract today Beautiful. so i I use Ladon's story, right, for my email list to show them, hey, this is just a numbers game. Like, you got to go out there and pound the I saw an interview you did that was very good. Uh, I don't know if that was Ladon or not. Was that the one on your website? No, she's not Ladon yet. I, I, she did okay. say, you know, I'll do it on video because you helped me do that. And I'm like, all right, girl, let's do it. But, you know, I <laughs> use Ladon's story because, I mean, Ladon doesn't have everything. She'll tell you she doesn't have everything perfectly figured out. For Ladon, it was really like, I'm in this situation. I'm not going back to where I was before. I'm going to go pound the pavement right now at this stage in my business. That looks like having as many sales conversations as possible so I can make some money because right now it's just a numbers game. So what I was realizing with some of my students and some of my private clients and some of my readers was they had all the systems in place, but they weren't having enough conversations. Okay. So I was like, how many sales conversations are you having a week? Oh, like two or three. And I'm like, you need mm. to move that up to like two or three every morning. Right. Okay. Because it's a numbers game. There's a funnel and some will convert. And some will convert and some won't. Exactly. So I feel, yeah, so that's one. Like people just don't have enough baskets for all their eggs. They put all their eggs okay. in too few baskets. So then they don't have leverage. Then they're super nervous. There's like a whole, and then they don't get results as quickly as someone as like Ladon. 
right? I think another thing is they're not assertive enough. So going back to Ladon, because it just happened and it's a good story. Mm -hmm. We were at a soul cycle class. I invited her to a spinning class. Uh, the instructor points out, oh, you know, we have our marketing manager for the Miami area taking a class with us today. She's right over there. Guess what Ladon did after class? She went to go set up a meeting with the marketing manager to be like, hey, this is what I do. Here's how I can help. So on and so forth. And I find that a lot of business owners. That was smart. That was very smart, right? Did she go in there thinking, oh, I'm going to go meet the marketing manager of SoulCycle? No, she was just hanging out with a friend and the marketing manager just happened to be there. But LaDawn thought fast. She thought that on is, her feet and she went that right is, over. That is, really, that is really smart. Well, guess who the next new smart person is? Me. You, you have a meeting that I, I hooked up with you tomorrow at 10. Cool. So I'm going to be the next success story. I, I do <laughs> fairly well, but I'm trying to do something a little different. I've never done any advertising. Everything's been word of mouth because I'm kind of a, a sassy and um, knowledgeable vieja. But I'm trying to do something different. I'd like some help. So I signed up. So I'll let everyone know how well I do. I can't wait. Yeah. And I think, David, you should do it. David I and should I do it, too. I absolutely could totally. He's doing something new, and I've been pushing his little Jewish ass to do something a little different. Because <laughs> he's amazing. When I first met him, he wasn't charging enough for what he was doing. He changes lives. He has so much knowledge. And I think in a short period of time, he could turn his new business around even more. Well, I mean, thank, he's been very successful, even thank just you for that. Yeah. in a short period of well, time. I, you know, like a lot of us, I, is, go, please. Oh, I think I know what you're going to say. Like, it can happen very quickly. You just have yes. to decide. Oh, it's a totally, yes. it's a, oh, pff, well, I've got stories about decision points and these inflection points where it's just a millisecond of deciding. Like age 19, when I decided I wanted to be in the jingle business, music for radio, TV, and film. And <laughs> the, the universe just went boing and it just like exploded. And the next 20 years of my life were just like wonderful. What happens for some of us uh, sassy grandmothers and grandfathers, and I'm not yet a grandfather, but you know, I'm in, I'm in an age where that could happen, no, no. is, um, is we reach what I'll call stall. We get stalled out and it may be because we're holding on, as you pointed out earlier. I think there's absolutely a quotient of that. I don't know what where that comes from, but I was a... a I play jazz music. So everything you've said in this segment, Amanda, resonates for me totally as I cast it out into the entrepreneurial world because in improvised music, I mean, it's all about taking the next, playing the next bar of music and you don't know what it's going to be. I mean, it's all about the risk profile of just casting it out and, and, and having faith that it'll work, you know? I mean, you can't unplay a note, right? On stage, right. for, for example. So the, a lot of the but thought, the thinking you're, this creative thinking you put in. Yeah, go ahead. One bad note on stage can get everyone to like you, David. That's I mean, right. And how no. you come back from a bad no, note. No, no, no. I, I'm not, and I'm not speaking of, of it from I'm afraid to play the next note. What I'm no, saying I is I not. never was afraid. And so what you've said has very much resonated with me because... Uh, tapping back into that now is what me is, you know, my my situation needs. And so many of us uh, that are listening to this can benefit from that fearless idea of, of uh, fear of the known is probably more of a problem than fear of the unknown. To you. So, Amanda, I see a lot of people like David and I who in our age group and a little younger and a little older, they start something, but then they don't really do much with it. What do we say to those people other than to please call Amanda? I mean, other than that, <laughs> what do we That's say to them? Say. All right. So I'll say the story of one of my clients. Um, so mm. one of my client, my private clients, not uh, one of my group clients, but one of my private clients was sort of in that position as well. Like she'd started this thing. She was holding on to things. She's in your age group. So it relates very well. And one of the things I did, and this is something I learned from attending a Tony Robbins seminar in West Palm Beach yeah. a few months ago. Mm -hmm. um, one of the exercises that he put us through was whatever fears we had, whatever was holding us back in that moment, he walked us through an exercise, which is one of the most intense things I've ever done in my whole life. Hmm. And it was an exercise where he just kept piling on the pain of what it felt like to not change. <laughs> yeah it Talk was about jolt. so intense and it was 10,000 people doing it at the same time like the things I heard while we were going through that exercise the people were crying I thought I was gonna have a panic attack in the middle of it it was really intense wow right That's cool so I had a, a coaching client or have a coaching client who that's kind of what was happening it's like all the ingredients were there but something was just not clicking something was not 
really working. And I was like, I got this crazy idea. And I was like, I'm going to try this exercise on her. I want to see if that'll do something. Right. So I was like, you have to trust me. And she goes, okay, I trust you. I'm like, I'm going to make you cry. Just FYI. If it starts coming, don't even just let it happen. Right. So I started piling on the pain of what it would feel like um, if she did you not do it for us. How do you pile on the pain? Let somebody hear the pain that might be theirs. Let me hear it. Oh, well, okay. In her case, I started off with, let me pile on the pain of what it feels like to be a failure, like to herself. Right. Yeah. It kind of got her to move a little bit. Not so much, right? Then I realized, oh, I know what will get her to move, right? As I was listening to her reactions. So I started piling on the pain of what it would feel like for her not to change and therefore not be a good example for her granddaughter. Mm. Oh, good one. Mm. That got her to change real quick. Because sometimes we can't even do it for ourselves. Sometimes it's a matter of doing it for someone else and, and for people, for a lot of people, sometimes especially it's especially women. I think especially many women, women. Yeah. We don't have to do it for ourselves. We just have to do it. And doing it for someone who needs us to do it is just as fine. I mean, I, I really made her feel like shit, right? Well, like I just kept piling it on, piling it on, piling it on. But so you how know, long did that take for her to accept within her mind that she was going to We go only had a session for like 90 minutes, an hour to 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. Right. So it wasn't, yeah, it, I don't even know how long minutes I was of pain to to um, prevent a lifetime of pain. To prevent a lifetime of pain. So it's a, yeah. a, like an inoculation. And then within the next eight weeks, she's taken more action and made more changes than she had in the previous six months. You must be so proud. That's so cool. Well, awesome. we'll, be, we'll be thinking of your client. Everyone send out good vibes to her. Ready, set, go. Send them out. I do believe the universe in sending out vibes. I always say send out the love. It works very well. Well, that's wonderful. Well, how about you then? What can we all do to help you get to the next level of where you are? Well, David and I were already talking about how he does a lot of internet radio. So we're going to be talking about that, David. Yeah. <laughs> sure. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Love to help. Yep. Um, well, you could always follow me on Twitter. I'm always on Twitter. If you want to have conversations with me, Twitter is the place to go. My DMs on Instagram are blowing up too. This is a very millennial thing. It's like, we're not even emailing okay. anymore. I'm we're just pretend DMing. I know what a DM is, but what is <laughs> direct <it>? message? <laughs> <laughs> and like, what is a direct even... message on Instagram? Yeah. It's like, we don't even email anymore. We're doing like direct messages on Instagram to do like right. business deals. And I noticed that do a few you, weeks ago and I was like, what is going on? Well, I had a question. <laughs> is, has there been a shift over to Instagram, uh, like away from LinkedIn? Like, like you, you guys don't hang out on LinkedIn so much. Huh? LinkedIn was never huge for me. It yeah. was never a big thing yeah. for me, for a couple of my clients. Uh, it is depending on what it is that they do. For well, me, right, the big ones have point. always been, yeah, for me, especially because, um, I'm a writer, for example, that's yeah. how I started was as a freelance writer. Yeah. Twitter was always big writers are all over twitter right press media that's all twitter yeah um and then because i specifically always spoke more about the millennial experience because i am one mm -hmm. instagram so and then i'm on facebook all day long literally all day so long. facebook's huge for, for you friends. as a population if i had to generalize yeah yeah in is. terms of even on the business side my son's a banker uh, with u.s bank and he's all over uh LinkedIn, because that's, as you say, it's what you do sometimes dictates. It's a little more of a structured, it's the well, structure of that environment. So how do the people in the audience figure out which is the social media um, platform that would be most effective for them? How do they discern that? I think it depends on what they're doing and what they're seeking. So for example, I said me, I'm a writer, right? So Twitter's where it's at for the writers, you know, with the tweet chats, the journalists that are always on there, uh, large media companies are always on Twitter looking for stuff, looking for sources, looking for quotes. So, for example, uh, if you want to be a thought leader or if you want to get more media mentions, maybe you don't even want to be a writer, but one of your goals is to get more media and more PR and more right. attention. You need to be on Twitter because that's okay. where you're going to find it. So what advice do you give people? How do they tweet? Is that the word or? Wait, did I get it right? Yes. Tweet. So I'm I'm personally a really big fan of tweet chats. In the personal finance space, we have a lot of tweet chats every week. So, for example, it's America Saves Week uh, this week, and a lot of personal finance bloggers are partaking in that, and they have like three tweet chats. Like I got an email about two tweet chats for that going on uh, this morning. So tweet chats are cool because you follow the 
the stream, you know, you follow the hashtag and there's certain websites you can go to and forget. I think TweetDeck is one of them. I'm getting the other one. So you could easily follow the the feed yeah. for that specific hashtag. Right. And then you have a moderator who asks specific questions and then you answer them and you get to know people. And I've met clients that way. Whoa. I've met um I've gotten uh, media attention that way. Sometimes I have journalists reach out to me because they remember me from a tweet chat where mm-hmm. they remembered one of the things I did. Um, oh, I've wait, partnered cool. with I've partnered with Intuit on a couple of their tweet chats. I did one with them last month as a part of a campaign. So, I mean, for me, I love, love, love the tweet chats. I try to get on them as often as I can. Um, and there's millions, like there's so many of them during the week. It's, it's crazy. There's credit chat. There's the America saves one. And I'm just saying the finance ones, you can find okay, it. So for, for those of us who maybe are virgins on tweet, how do we choose wisely our time and our focus? How do we know which stream or whatever to follow? It's all about ROI for me. I always follow the numbers and follow the money, right? Ah, good advice. So, for example, um, I invested in Pinterest for a while Mm -hmm. because I was like, oh, yeah, Pinterest. I was getting good traffic, so let me hire someone to do Pinterest. Well, then Pinterest changed their algorithm, and I'm like, well, now I'm just wasting money. I'm going to go put that money somewhere else where it's going to make me more money, right? So I think it's being – and, again, that goes to that idea of changing very quickly when you have to. Right. I think sometimes people hold on. And for me, it's like, no, as soon as I see something's not working, I'm done and putting that money somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. That is smart. But I think you're doing something that many people are uncomfortable doing. It's called thinking. And they have to actually <laughs> notice things and think. Right. It's um, paying attention. That's really what it is. It is paying attention. I call that notice what? therapy. Yes. Paying yeah, attention. And it, it's the same thing in personal finance. People are like, oh, you're so good at money. And I'm like, actually, I screw up all the time. I just pay attention more than most people. Yeah. And it's the same yeah. thing in business. It's just a matter of like pay attention. That's all it is. It sounds like a great start of a wonderful life. I hope everyone out there is super frustrated or angry or annoyed so that they get the energy (laughs) they need to reinvent themselves. Yeah, man. And um, we talked to Dr. Gail Carson, who helps women and uh, other people in business uh, reinvent themselves. But Amanda, how can people reach you? Because I think everyone needs a little bit of you in their lives. How do they reach you? Oh, thank you. I think everyone needs a little bit of me in their lives, too. (laughs) Good. See, now people in my generation would have said, oh, no, you know, that modesty thing. Oh, right. The self-evasing stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we should all embrace that. No, I own it. I've learned. And I used to be like that, too. So I don't think that's a generational thing. I think that's uh, a cultural thing. mm -hmm. And what's also cultural. Yeah. So what I've noticed is like, no, the more I embrace it and the more I own it. (laughs) <laughs> hey, I'm not, and I, I try, I call it quiet confidence. Like I'm not doing it from a place of like, yeah, I'm conceited. I'm doing it from a place of, yeah, I know my shit. Right. There's a difference. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I think there's a, there's a fine line yeah. in terms of that yeah. difference. And yeah. there's certain little like nuances, right. in the way that you communicate and your body language, you guys can't see the video right now, you know, but there's right. certain little nuances, right. little social cues, things like that. You know, uh, I agree. I think you're doing a fabulous job of letting people know you know your stuff. So how do people reach you? So you can go to AmandaAbea.com. You'll find the podcast, uh, you know, classes, uh, blog posts. I've got new content coming out all the time on the website. If you yourself want to learn how to pitch media and you also want me in your inbox to hear the really great stories like LaDawn's story, because I only share those via email, uh, you can sign up on the website, AmandaAbea.com at the top. Or you can also go to amandaabea.com forward slash pitch and you'll get a worksheet that shows you the exact uh, email structure I use to pitch clients, to pitch media. That worksheet has gotten me on Forbes. It got me a column at Inc. It gets me clients. Uh, I do a lot of content marketing for financial companies. Yep. That one little, it got me on Entrepreneur on Fire, which is like the top business podcast probably ever. Um, So that little worksheet can can get you a lot just that one worksheet that um or brilliant. you can, yeah or you can find me on twitter or instagram because those are my main jam uh at amanda abeya and i'm on there all the time okay and for those of you who don't know spanish it's a b e l l a abeya abeya all right. And I think that we will all obey you and uh, start a new life using our frustration to re-energize. You have been a hoot and a half. 
please do come back again and tell us more about what you're doing. I will. Next time we'll drink cortadito while we're doing it. So we can, yeah. see, mijita, see. So we can just and be super caffeinated and extra. <laughs> you had it. your cafecito before. I had mine before. Yeah. We have Next David we'll having his, but he has to have one. I got to um, have the real thing. You know, this is uh, you have the, the Jewish the real version. Thing. No, no, no. Right. The real thing is the Cuban. If only all the Jewish community would know about cafecito, I have to say it would be make the world a better place. This you wouldn't need three cups of coffee. You just need the little one. Just a little concentrated one. Just a little concentrated one. I like that. One. Oh, it's, it, it's the best. Well, thank you very much. And everyone knows that Make Money Your Honey is your book. Everyone should read it. And uh, Amanda, you really are a gem. Thank you for oh, making thank the world you. a better place. That Thanks, means so Amanda. Much. Coming, from, coming from a Cuban grandma, that means so much. Well, I, you, speak, <laughs> you know, I don't say anything that I don't mean. Exactly. So, Amanda Abella, she, we have heard wisdom from the best of the best in business, and we are all now become the best that we can be. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to Step Up with Dr. Margarita Gurry. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes and visit RedShoeInstitute.com for more information about Dr. Margarita Gurry and the work she does.